You're listening to... Offering in-depth analysis on all things Boston Celtics. With your hosts, Jim and Mike Quigley. Pitcher has just checked in. Porzingis way outside, knocks down another. What a start in his finals debut. Irving blocked by Porzingis. He's doing it all. Hauser, three-pointer. It's a Celtic avalanche here in the first quarter of 17. Tatum gets past Irving, stripped and stolen by Irving. Here comes Josh Green, one man to beat, but it's a seven-footer who blocks it again. Mike, game one's in the books, and it could not have played any better for the Celtics or really any worse for the Mavericks. Um, It was... You know, we talked about before on the pod, you know, when they played the Mavericks during the season and at the beginning of the playoffs and how this was just a really good matchup for the Celtics. And and you really saw why last night. I, You know, they limited the Mavericks' offense in ways the Mavericks really haven't been limited at all in these playoffs. They took away the corner three. They took away the lob dunks, and they turned this into a completely a complete isolation game for Luca. Um, and there'll be a lot of talk, Mike. A lot of talk about you know you'll hear the term shot variance. I don't think it was that at all. I think this came down to shot attempts from three for the Mavericks, uh, what they were getting at the rim, um, and how they changed that without becoming a Luka or Kyrie-centered offense where the ball's in their hands for most of the possession. And maybe they don't. Maybe they just take advantage of the matchups from those guys a little bit more, look at what happened when things were going well in the third and try to um, go from there. But I just thought it was a clinic defensively for the Celtics. Um, And we could talk about strategy and all those different things, and we should. Um, But just a great dominant performance for the Celtics. And, Mike, I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on what you saw last night, what you see going forward, and how this changes or doesn't change your view of the series. Well, last night certainly was Christoph Porzingis. When he came into the game, everything everything shifted. Uh, offensively, Dallas didn't, have any, uh, Dallas didn't have any options for him or answers. On the high post, uh, they tried a big with Derek Lively, and he couldn't stay with him and got dunked on. They tried smaller guys that Porzingis was just playing with and hitting his jumper. And on the defensive end, he was incredible. He was a rock star. I mean, blocking, blocking shots, sprinting back on defense and blocking shots on fast break, blocked the Kyrie Irving jumper. It was just play after play. Uh, and the momentum just continued really until the last three minutes of the second half. But the Celtics' worst minutes were really when he wasn't on the floor. And also credit to Al Horford. His defense was good, too. He had, he had a blocked three-point shot in the second half that I thought was a big play. Uh, he was caught on an island against Luka a lot. And I thought he held his own for the most part against... Um, Luke is awesome, by the way. Um, and offensively I, I I just thought it was it was a night for Pazingas and uh Jalen Brown's defense last night too he, especially in the third quarter what Jalen Brown did to stop that run on both ends of the floor was really impressive I mean that was championship basketball he had two block shots at the rim um you know a guard making those plays just an unbelievable athleticism and the three he hit to kind of get them going the pass he had to Tatum off that play you just alluded to. Uh, he was really the only rhythm to their offense in the second half. Uh, so, yeah, great win. Um, also, Jim, we'll, we can talk about it in this pod. I thought the Celtics got a little lucky during that run. Uh, um, and that was scary a little bit. And this game could have shifted in a different way, despite the fact that the Celtics dominated uh, for the most pretty much all game. How, did, how were they lucky? 
I thought they were lucky with uh, they gave up some like uncontested a very late contested wide open threes to Dallas that didn't go in. And two of them were to Kyrie Irving. Um, and that, and one was to Luca. And then there were two travel calls that were clearly travels and yeah. they were the right calls. I'm glad the refs made them, but we've watched a lot of NBA games where those calls are, aren't made. Um, and they were both big, big plays. One was a Kyrie. Uh, it's like a jumper in the paint that he made. Uh, it was just continuing that Dallas run. And the other one was, uh, uh, you know, a rebound that Derek Lively got. Um, it was another poor possession offensively for the Celtics. And the Celtics on that second chance that possession scored. So I, even though it was the right call, they're not calls you always see made um, in the NBA. So I felt like those were big calls. Those travels were big calls that, that helped the momentum of that game. And well, they were the they weren't going to make them. They traveled. Both guys traveled multiple times. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, they did. So, I mean, they were so obvious that it was almost hard not to make them. Uh, the Kyrie one, he slid. Uh, yeah. He there was a lot and, of that last night. Yeah. So, like, and then he then he moved his pivot point twice after that. Um, so, that, you know, that, that had to be called. Um, and I, um, yeah, so the Dallas had some missed open threes. I'll tell well, you, during, the big, I'm just talking during that run. Yeah, that big run that they were on when we were getting uncomfortable. We were texting saying, "Oh, if Dallas wins this game, this is going to be hard to bounce back from." Like it felt that way for a little bit. It felt that way until the timeout, and then I, I yeah. felt the Celtics just played with a different level of intensity and get look. I, I the, that Dallas run. And we can talk about it right now. Is it wasn't like they were moving the ball and creating all these open shots, and well, they were just going to the hoop. They were going to the hoop. They were getting to the middle. A lot of it was with Przingis on the bench. Luca was making some contested threes, um, but it was mostly just Luca. And it, you know, every once in a while, you'll have you had um, a PJ Washington drive or. You know, uh, an effort play that would get them a basket, but it, there was no lobs, there was no corner threes. Um, it wasn't one of those runs where you know everyone was kind of getting going, and so I, I just, I just kind of, you know, you look back at it and you, 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 it's easy to say now in hindsight, but once the Celtics kind of played with the level of intensity they had when playing on defense on Luka, on the ball, it, things kind of turned for them quickly. Yeah, there were very few. So when I, I asked you about the luck, the reason I asked that, so they had those missed threes during the, after that run. But there were very few times during that game when I'm watching it where I didn't think like this that the Mavericks it felt like everything took max effort to score. It, it took a lot of energy. You never sat there and said, "Oh boy," you know. PJ Washington would have a effort like kind of offensive rebound. A Luca would really have to work it down to the clock, and and he'd make a tough shot. Uh, you know, he's driving to the lane. There was no alley-oop dunks. They're the best corner three-point shooter team in the league. I can't even remember three-point corner shots from them last night. I'm sure they happened. They didn't happen. They only, had one in the, they only had one through the first, like, three and a half quarters. It's crazy. And yeah. they took 26 threes, and some of them were, you know, in that last five-minute uh, game that really doesn't matter. It, you know... It's so people are going to talk about it's a make miss league. I didn't think it was that. I, I don't. I think it was the Celtics completely limited everything they wanted to do. And what they want to do is, you know, their assists all come off of Luca or Kyrie, you know, driving, breaking down the defense, drawing two. The Celtics never sent two. You know, even more of those Al Horford possessions, Al, they, they didn't send help. They, they didn't really send help on Kyrie. It, they did not leave the corners. They did not leave the dunker spot. And, you know, we talked about on this pod that they were going to play Tatum on the five. They did and that, have, yeah. like, 
Porzingis or Al stat off on Derek Jones or, or PJ Washington. And that's exactly what they did. And then they tried to change in game. The adjustment that Dallas made in game is they had Jones come up and be the screener. And a lot of times Brown was able to fight around that or, you know, the, the Celtics just lived with the results and they weren't, they weren't going to leave the other guys. And it's almost, I, I heard a stat on ESPN last night. That through the first two rounds, Dallas was shooting 56 or 57% on Luka assists, which is an insane number. That's so, like, a so the cell uh, is a strategy here that, okay, you, you shoot 35 times a game. Maybe you score 40. Maybe you score 50. We're just going to live with it and see what happens. And I, uh, I, I kind of think it might be the right strategy. And, and I, the Celtics are uniquely built, unlike the other two teams that they've played so far, to really deal with the Luka body blows and be able to cover him one-on-one -on -one and live with the results. Um, I do think they'll make adjustments. I think you'll see some side pick and rolls between him and Kyrie. Um, maybe they'll start the offense a little bit, roll with Kyrie in the ball in his hands and try to get the ball into Luka a little bit later in the clock. But... You know they're not they're actually they're not really built to stop moving the ball, you know they and they're not built to play five out like the Celtics are and they, and that's where Dallas had troubles on the other end. We I mean we kind of nailed this on the pod a lot of it going into the game. Dallas you know they want to take away everything at the rim and the Celtics basically said okay we're going to drive and kick and we're going to play five out and we're going to draw your bigs out and we're just going to make them effective and they ended up. You know, getting a lot of open threes, and then that eventually broke them down, and they were able to get things in the paint. I, I think this is a real bad matchup for Dallas. Last night didn't dissuade me from that. I think they'll play better, and I think they'll make some adjustments, and they'll probably get a win. And the Celtics have a huge issue with being complacent in Game Twos, especially after they play like games like this today. But I look back and I think about what's beat the Celtics in these playoffs in particular. It's when teams have come out and they've focused that they were going to outshoot the Celtics from three. We And we're going to limit their threes. And is Dallas built to do that? It's a, I think it's a real question. Are they built to do that to the Celtics? And if they can't do it that way, what do they do to beat them? And... Um, and I'm not talking about over one game. I'm talking over a seven-game series. And outside of Luka going nuts, I'm not sure what that is. Does that make sense? Yeah, Jim. Uh, I agree. I mean, last night certainly reinforced a lot of what we were talking about. Certainly, J.J. Reddick's been talking a lot about the fact that you don't have any players in the Celtics that you can play off of similar to against like the Clippers and the Minnesota Timberwolves where they didn't have to cover P.J. Tucker. They didn't really have to get out on Jaden McDaniels. It, the Celtics don't provide you that option. Even with their bench players, last night Sam Hauser came in and played really well and hit his open looks. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if, I'm, if I'm Dallas, I do I do look at that second half and I I try to take from there what I was doing defensively and try to carry that over into the next game. I think that's where you beat the Celtics and is on the defensive end. Certainly the same game plan for the Celtics. You beat the Mavs with, with playing tenacious defense. When the Celtics are playing hard defense like that, they're almost impossible to beat when they're locked in defensively. And, you know, they have moments basically every game where they, they forget to do that and they let teams back into it. But uh, um, if, if I'm the Mavs, some of my adjustments are definitely maybe doubling Christoph Porzingis on the high post and seeing if he's able to make the correct pass out of that. And it, even if he is, I feel like the Celtics really feed off of his rhythm early in games. It's been an MO all season that Jalen Brown and Porzingis are the guys in the first quarter. And so I would put, I would be changing up my defensive schemes early in games to force Tatum to be a scorer 
and allowing him to have a one on one matchup. And I'd be forcing Jalen Brown and Christoph Bazingas to be my decision makers. That might throw the Celtics off a little bit. Um, it's not something I would do all game, but I think that's how I might start game two. And if that allows me to take away Porzingis' rhythm offensively and he becomes a non-factor, I think that helps my chances of winning the game. Uh, same with Jalen Brown. If I'm able to throw him off with a double team, even if it's only once in a while in the first quarter, um, to not allow him to find his rhythm and then to put the pressure on Tatum. I, I, that might sound crazy, especially after what I said during the last pod, but that might be my game plan to start game two is, okay, Tatum, you got your one-on-one match up against Derek Jones Jr. You're the best matchup right now. Go to your drive and kick. We're going to hack the shit out of you when you get to the paint, like we did in game one. Yeah. Maybe the rest won't call again. I think that's and let's, it. let's see. Let's see how it goes. Um, because if I'm able to take Porzingis out of his rhythm and Jalen Brown out of his rhythm, um, then it's a game where I'm, I'm forcing one guy, similar to what the Celtics are doing to Luca, to beat me to make the right decisions over and over again. Yeah, I, 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 I think, I think it still just becomes a numbers game for the Celtics. So. And I, this is I I just look at this as a math issue as much. It as becomes anything. a numbers game. It becomes a numbers game if Jason Tatum's playing the right way. Well, and he was last night. So he, he, yeah, he, but it's easy. What I'm saying, Jim, and this is it's like yeah, a I'm, it's ahead. a slight adjustment. What I'm saying is last night he was getting two or three guys thrown at him. In game two, I'm just throwing one guy at him. Yeah, and he's going two or three guys, and that's the reason he wasn't able to finish at the in the basket and had to kick it out is because you, you overloaded it. And now you're going to put up, you're essentially doing, you're giving him the opportunities that Jalen Brown has had. Yeah. And you're overloading the floor for Brown. That's I, what I'm doing. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that's exactly I, I, what I, I'm doing in game two. I, 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 I they could try that. I, I think you're playing with a huge, I think you're giving the best player on the floor for the Celtics the most opportunity, opportunity. by doing that. Yeah. And I, I, and I it could it could backfire. Yeah, but I, I, think I it don't would. think I, I think putting two two or three guys on him, we've seen now for five straight games, that doesn't work. Going back to Indiana and now going to Dallas, Tatum's okay. Tatum's okay with passing out of that and in, in driving and kicking. I want to see if he's still going to be okay with that when I say, hey, you know what? I'm doubling your teammate instead. When Porzingis gets the ball, I'm throwing two at him. I'm going to overload on Brown. You know, I'm disrespecting you right now. Is that going to force you to play a different way? I would take a look at that, even if it's only for a quarter, to see how he reacts. And yeah, maybe you, you, know, you treat it as a curveball. I, I... I just think he creates. I think the same these are the problem. kind of things you got to do. <laughs> yeah, I think it creates yeah. the same problem for you. Just on the, other, you know, with a different guy that's better at um, dealing with that. I, and, is I, Brown, I, and is Brown able to make those decisions that Tatum can make with that kind of defensive look on him? I don't know. And maybe you take away Jalen Brown completely. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I, you can't double both Brown and Porzingis. So they're gonna sure. have to pick their poison when they're in the game. Uh-huh. So you, you know it's it's it sounds good in theory. They say you do it to both, but it doesn't work that way. So they'd have to pick one, and you, you and this has been the problem off season playing the Celtics is you, you teams have gone in saying we need to take away Tatum, and then Porzingis gets these mismatches. And yeah, all season. All season, and he's kind of been the X factor there, where he gets guys like Josh Green on him or Derek Jones Jr. So, how do you make that switch? Do you all of a sudden not double the wing players and you start to double Porzingis? Um, and what does that op- that will open up a lot of opportunities for the Celtics? And Porzingis has been much better of a passer this season than I think he has been in other seasons. A lot of that well, has I to do thought, because he's playing with a lot better players. Yeah. And I mean, Dallas, I thought, go yeah. ahead. I thought in the second half, um, putting Luca on posing, Porzingis on the post worked for Dallas. 
maybe you start with that. Well, I do think Dallas switched more. And sometimes, maybe that's what they're going to do. Maybe they're going to play some zone on the defensive side. I did think they switched a lot more in that second half. And sometimes when you switch against the Celtics, their guys get complacent. And okay. you, we've seen it all year where they start to settle for shots or they put up shots early. Um, or they try to take advantage of individual matchups later when they could have better ones. And I'm not sure that if that's what caused some of that in the third, I'd really have to go back and look. But you saw Joe uh, Missoula, and he he's had a great playoffs. Like, there's no – I the idea that yeah. this guy can't coach is, is so wrong now. I'm, I'm convinced completely – I'm on the other side of that now. You know, I, I still can't stand some of his douchiness in the press conference and things like that. But in terms of being a coach, he – He's been awesome. And, you know, you come out of those thirds, you run the side pick and roll with Tatum being the screener, and then you had Tatum going downhill. Even on that lively, you know, travel, initially Tatum went to the basket, and, and you know, it could have easily been called a foul. Didn't convert, you know, lively travels. The next couple of drives were screens for Brown. Brown goes you know, just really smart drives right into Lively's body. So Lively could do nothing but bring his hands down and make contact with Brown. He was able to pick up four and five fouls just like that. Um, or they were driving kicks from Brown where you hit Holiday and then back to Tatum for the wide open three, or you hit uh, Horford in the corner, wait in the clock, and he hit that big three. They were just able to get to the paint with those two guys and they switched up the screeners. You know, there was no holding the ball, waiting for a matchup. It was attacking the hoop and using your guards or using your wings as your screeners. You didn't see Pazingas. You didn't see Horford out there setting the screens. And it, it just gave them opportunity after opportunity late in that third quarter. I mean, they, their offense was awesome for the last four minutes of that third quarter. It was he, he, so again, it was Missoula recognizing. And again, I, I I have to look, but I imagine it just be it was Dallas more switching. But it, you know, I'm not sure. But he saw something that you know whatever they do were doing in the first half they couldn't do anymore, and they needed to make adjustments. And their adjustments just killed killed Dallas. And, and defensively, they you know the Celtics gave. If you want to say one thing about the, the players and the team, they stuck to their game plan. Yep. They they did not get outside it. The only time they got outside it was very early in the game where the ball went to Gafford and Tatum was on Gafford and Horford, for some unexplicable reason, went to double. And uh, Jones Jr. got a wide open three from the above the break and he nailed it. You didn't see the another first play double. of the game? Yeah, it was very early on. It was really early in the game. You never saw that again. The the Mavericks role players never got a, you know, didn't make another three. I'm not sure how many open threes they had um, after that, the role players. Um, there was kind of this theme or talking point during the game, I thought, from the announcers and a little bit from the pundits afterwards that Dallas left a lot of points on the table. You brought up a couple of really good examples of that, of Luka missing that open three where the Celtics screwed up the assignment, and I know Kyrie had one or two. But there wasn't many opportunities that they left on the table. I, I, the Celtics you, lost. You know, that's a, a crazy thought about it. Go ahead. What did you say, that, Mike? The pundits are wrong. The Celtics left a lot of points on the table. I thought the Celtics so missed a ton of wide open looks yeah. in the second half. Almost as if they were shooting themselves out of the game at one point. Um, they what they and they were doing exactly what I said not to do in the last pod. They were getting the three early in the shot clock. Yeah, and it would be like Drew Holiday and Derek White. I love you guys shooting the ball, but they were better options if you if you just made one more pass or you had the defender run to you and you drove again, you could have got a better in-rhythm shot. And the Celtics were settling for those early looks. Don't settle against Dallas. Uh, 
a good look is a good look, but you can get a great look almost every time down. Um, it's almost like you have to play so unselfish. You have to give up a lot of your pride by moving the ball a lot more against Dallas because you're going to get those looks from three uh, that they were taking advantage of in the first half because a lot of those threes they were hitting the, in the first half weren't the first open look. It was off another pass, uh, specifically an Al Horford three they hit, they hit early in the game. Um, and so the pundits are wrong. The Celtics left a lot of points on the board. The Celtics only scored 44 points in the second half. They only hit five threes. I'd like to see the statistic on the amount of open threes that they missed, the amount of times that they missed at the rim in the second half. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, poor Zingas in the second half didn't score really at all. And he had, he had an open runner in the lane. He had an open jumper. He had a jumper where he just shot over the top of Luka and it wasn't even close. Al Horford and Derek White shot wide open air balls from three in the second half. That's what I was saying. I, I, I thought everybody was slipping last night because it looked like the ball at points in that game were slipping out of the Celtics' hands over and over again, whether it be like wild passes into the crowd, um, Jason Tatum just losing control of the ball, um, like a lot of sweat on the court or something last night. But, yeah, the Celtics left a lot of points on the board. And a question I have for you, Jim, about Porzingis, are you concerned at all that his second half he looked a lot different? And that he was on a minutes count. Um, the minutes count was interesting. In, in I, you know, I kind of wonder why they weren't starting him. I, I think it became apparent they were playing minute for minute with Lively, and the the, the Celtics were super concerned about his ability to score at the rim and get going. Um, you know, I think they're afraid a, a couple alley oop dunks is gonna, you know, soften your defense, and all of a sudden those corner threes become open. So they wanted to have Pazingas's length in there, like we talked about on the pod, to make it a three on three game on the alley oop instead of a two on two game, and, uh -huh. and just increase their math numbers. The Celtics like they want to have the advantage. Uh, they wanted to have the two on ones on offense, and they wanted to keep it even on defense and they were able to do that. Um, but I thought he looked good. You know, I, I thought even in the minutes I, in the second half where I know he missed a couple shots, but I, I didn't see any movement issues with him. I mean, he had that giant block, um, he did. you he know, did. on the dunk attempt right in, uh, you know, in that third quarter there with Dallas, you know, you was trying to, and that's where the Kyrie three half, the missed three, wide open three happened. It was just kind of off accident where he had an open three after the Celtics broke down the interior. I, know. I thought that was going to be a huge momentum shift. Yeah. I thought Irving was going to drill that. And um, Kyrie just um, continues it, to shit himself in Boston. Um, yeah. Which is yeah. another storyline. He really is, I mean, one point dribbling the ball off his foot. He just, he shits his pants here. And, you know, and that's not talked about enough. But, you know, I thought he looked good. And maybe the minutes count was as much for his um, cardio, where he hasn't played, uh -huh. as anything else. But it does make sense. It makes a lot of sense to, you know, match him minute for minute with Lively. Um, it was actually really smart, you know, and something I had not thought about. Uh, Horford can handle Gafford. Um, I mean, Tatum can handle Gafford pretty well without, you know, having – the type of Przingis help over the top, I don't think he could with Lively. And, you know, that's that's a huge difference. And so um, I I just thought that was really smart. And, and you know, I'm, I'm also thinking back, the one thing you didn't see during that run offensively from the Celtics is you didn't see the attacks on Luka. So maybe they hit him better. Um, and although, you know, they didn't, I don't think they scored a ton over Luka, but you saw a lot of drives from Tatum and Brown go at him, and then the ball stopped moving in that first half. You know, part of when the Celtics had issues, it was almost like Tatum would make a late red read where he knew he had to pass, and then it ended up turning it over. Um, but the majority of the time, he was making the right reads, and the ball was moving, and he wasn't forcing a shot against Luka and trying to get into that physical game like you had talked about, and it opened up things. And they come out of that timeout again, and immediately they get Brown going downhill against Luka. 
and he was able to kick to the right person. Um, I think they know uh, Luca cannot stay in front of Brown. You know, he, he'll put in a good effort. He'll use his physicality to try to slow him down, but Brown's pretty resilient now. He's so much better that, with the dribble than he was last year that he can get past that first wave of physicality and keep going. And yeah, and the, it's the Dallas yeah. doesn't have an answer once Luke is on an island. You know, they, even that monster, unbelievable dunk in the first half, they were able to find Brown on Luca. He crossed him up with his, you know, just yep. skill and speed. And then the next thing you know, he had a little room and he kind of stuffed it right down Gafford and Kyrie's throat. Yeah, it, it was that was, it was play awesome. of the game. Um, and, and again, I don't know. They, I think they tried to hide him and successfully did for the start of the third, and the Celtics figured it out. Yeah, I, I think you have to maybe just hide him on whoever the Celtics' big is in the game, and, yeah. and say, "Don't help, don't help." You're, you're, you're overplaying on Porzingis. You're overplaying on Al, and hopefully. You know, you can help us take them away. I, I, Dallas doesn't have a lot of options. Um, and we no. already talked about what they can do. As far as uh, the Celtics go, it was driving me crazy last night because Brown and Tatum would cross up, whether it be Luca or other matchups, and get to the paint and make the right decisions. And these guys couldn't finish a lot of the time. But how, it be can, like, can we go back to what you just said before you say, I want to ask you on this. How don't you help on a Brown and Tatum drive? Because they're beating the first defender so easily. Well, I'm just that, that's where, like, the, Dallas – so it's not a Celtics situation where the Celtics can stay in front of their guys and stay in front of these guys pretty good, but they don't have to help. The, their initial defense either has to just really improve on Ta- Tatum and Brown, or are they just going to give up layups? Yeah, I mean – Like, what do I they get do? It. I get it. I, I think that – it's seeing if the Celtics will play the right way and keep going to the rim. Um, you know, at, at times Indiana would would force the Celtics to play a little ugly by playing that way, uh, by yeah, just defending what, the three point line. Just, what adjustment do you make to do that? Because they were sending the help last. The, the Celtics would beat Luca, and you'd have to send the help, and the Celtics made the right play. You know, I, I said that I wouldn't have Luca be a helper at all so he can't get switched into anything. I would I would tell Luca you're sticking to Porzingis. That's your that's your matchup and you're not leaving him. That's that's what I would try. Because he's not much of a helper anyways. It's not like when Tatum's driving it's Luca stopping him at the rim. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd be trying to, as you said, hide Luca as much as possible. And I think the way I look at best hiding him is he's strong enough to to push Porzingis off the block and to keep Porzingis shooting jump shots. And yes, in game one, Porzingis was hitting him, but in what the second half, what do you do with half, Lively and Gafford? Well, who do they? De- cover? Yeah, Derek Lively is going to have to cover Drew Holiday. <laughs> so you That's what have- you're going to have to do. Yeah, so you, I mean, and they'll nothing. run the action against him. So there'll be yeah. nothing in the paint. Yeah, but it's not like Derek Lively can cover Porzingis either. Um, yeah, there'll be nothing in the paint. Yeah, I oh, I guess it's hard, Jim. I don't know. I don't know what the options are. We'll have yeah. to see what Jason Kidd's adjustments are. Um, but I, I'm I'm putting, like I said earlier, my, my adjustment going into game two is I'm no longer d- doubling Jason Tatum in the first quarter. My doubles are going to be the Porzingis or Brown. And I'm going to force them to make those decisions. Yeah, I think um, what you do, you have to, maybe that's, maybe you're, you're onto something because you have to take away the three somehow. You can't, you, the Celtics can't shoot 53s and think you're going to yeah. beat them. And, and you, so you've got to find a way to shoot at least 10 more. At least ten more, if not fifteen more. You can't twenty six is, is not enough. It's not near. It's not close to enough. And that's I, what the paces did. But the problem with the paces is the same thing that we're seeing with Dallas. The Pacers didn't shoot enough threes. No, the Pacers didn't hit enough threes. And then the, the they the, were the Pacers were able to get to the hoop, but they, there was no Porzingis. Yeah, there was no Porzingis, and 
you know, Dallas is going to have to figure out a way to hit some threes. They have to. Um, yeah. And they play so, differently. It, it, the paces play differently. And Miami plays differently where it's not about one guy. Yeah. And so they, they will – they have a bunch of guys that can run an offense to get some open looks and force switches on the Celtics that are a little bit tougher. I mean, that's that's a thing. Like the Celtics defense had to work on Luca, and Luca tried to hunt guys. He tried to hunt Hauser, you know. He tried to hunt Porzingis, a uh, uh, Horford. He had some success. Don't. But the other guys just had to, had to stay game plan specific, and there was no real ball movement. This wasn't. I think the Pacers' attack is much more difficult for the Celtics to guard than what Dallas presents. Yeah. So, Tim, I want to shift gears a little bit because I only have a few more minutes. Um, last night, I sent you a text saying that I think Tatum's going to play much better for the Celtics and win three more. Yeah. Uh, you know, so what, I, what I've been thinking about is this was really it reminded me a lot, of it, a lot of two years ago where the Celtics won game one in Golden State. Tatum didn't play. Uh, he played horrible in that game. I mean, mm-hmm. he he played good last night. That game won against Golden State. He was he was a mess. Um, yeah. And the uh, the talk after the game was, "Wow, we got this one without Tatum." Um, and then we saw what happened in the rest of that series. So, any concern level with Tatum? You know, in, he in, just the, gotta, in the championship, he just got to cut down on the turnovers. So the turnover number was six. That's way too high. Um, you know, and a lot of that I thought was early on making the wrong read and, and kind of forcing the action. So he's going to make that read earlier. I thought he got better throughout the game. His shot attempts were only 16. So it wasn't like he was forcing at all. You know, mm-hmm. it wasn't like he was forcing at all. He had a little bit of trouble scoring at the rim. I thought a couple of times he should have went to the line. But if he – this is what they're going to give him. And he cuts – if that turnover number goes from five to two – a five to three, I mean, six to three or whatever. And the assist number in, in exchange goes six, seven, or eight. Um, and he's scoring around 20 points. If this is what they're giving him, and he, I think he's, that's how you want him to play. You don't want him to, there's no, he doesn't have to be Luca and go one on one here because his teammates are so good. He's got a really good team. So just make the right read and keep the ball moving. Um, and I know people want to look at the scoring, but that that didn't trouble me all that much. It really didn't. Yeah. You know, no, he, I, I, they were th- yeah. throwing the defense at him, and he's making the read. So cut down on the turnovers, and it, uh, the game will look a lot better. So the turnover number is it wasn't good. That that's the issue I had. Outside of that, I thought rebounding, defense, attacking the hoop, all that was good. Uh, yeah, I thought I thought he was attacking the hoop and. The turnovers were obviously concerning, and I don't think they can win with him turning the ball over. And additionally, I think there were opportunities where he was passing on the drives where he could go up strong to the rim and get to the line, and he wasn't. Yeah. So I hope they I hope they look at those adjustments because, especially during that run, I was glad to see him hit a big three because you need your star players to show up during those runs. And that run went on for a long time. Um we didn't see a lot of Tatum trying to, you know, go to the basket and get to the free throw line. Uh, getting to the free throw line during a run is huge. That's something the Celtics have always struggled with: is getting to the free throw line during those moments. And I think it's a part of Tatum's game when he wants to get to that next level. Is I do think he needs to get to the free throw line more. Last night, I think he shot two for the game. And he didn't get those two free throws until the game was over. Um, yeah, late, late into the fourth quarter. So. Um. Yeah, it'd be interesting though because Dallas isn't Golden State. They're not built like Golden State, where they can beat you for three. So even with Tatum turning the ball over, maybe the Celtics still can win. Um, but Jim, I have to get off. I don't know if you have any final thoughts um, to say before we get off the pod and we move on to Game Two, which I hope we go up two zero. That would be awesome. Yeah, no, just that, you know, game one doesn't make a series. As uh, as giddy as I am about how the Celtics match up against them, if they get complacent in this thing, it can easily take game two. I mean, there's enough history in, for the Celtics to know that. In these playoffs and the last NBA Finals, God, you can go back to the 
uh, Memorial Day massacre in 1985 where the Celtics um, just killed the Lakers and the Lakers came back uh, and won game two. And, you know, Magic had that hook shot that just, you know, still, I think, sticks in the heart of most Boston fans. I, I stick to your game plan. Um, and, you know, continue getting to the hoop and they should be fine. Mike, does this change your prediction at all? I know you were saying, was this six you were saying, or the seven you were saying with the Celtics is, yeah, you moved off of anything. That's my last question for you. Because no. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really not, but I, I know I said six. I'm actually probably leaning more that this is going to be a five-game series. I still think it's a deep series that goes six or seven. Still going to win games in Dallas. They've been really good at home. Um, and we we know how the Celtics are going to come out in game two. So uh, I hope you're wrong. Yeah. I, I, that, it does. That game two is the game that um, makes. If I was going to pick a game they were going to lose for the rest of the series, it would be Sunday. Yeah. I, I hope I'm wrong there, but that would be it. I, I would not be shocked if Boston goes down to Dallas and wins both games. That would not stump me whatsoever. All right, Jim. Well, hopefully that happens. Um, great pod and on to game two. And yeah, got one in the books. Three more to go. That's it. Three more to go. All right. Talk All to right. everyone soon.